In 1984, a father and son are bargaining with an arms dealer to buy AK-47S at a lower price. Richard Worsha Sr. tricked the seller by threatening him with the loss of his license as he was about to sell the gun to a 14-year-old. The Worsha family lives in Detroit. The city has fallen into decline, but Richard is not planning to leave. He dreams of opening a chain of video rental stores and making a lot of money. Richard saw a car belonging to a black hustler outside his house. The purchased AK-47 would come in handy to threaten his daughter's lover. Dawn is already high. Her father commanded her to get ready as they were going to a cafe for ice cream. But Dawn is more interested in hanging out with Tyrone. She ran after his car in just her underwear. Just then her grandparents arrived and also got involved in the family quarrel. In the basement, Richard crafted silencers for the purchased AK-47S. The next morning, Dawn woke her brother and warned him that she was leaving. She is going to Tyrone because, in her opinion, staying under the same roof with their father is simply impossible. White people live in the suburbs of Detroit while the city center is populated by poor African Americans. Young Richard is a white crow here. He went to a gang hideout and offered the criminals AK-47S and silencers. The silencers significantly increased the price of the weapons. Rudal was shocked by the boy, he just showed up risking his own neck. He invited Ricky to come to their rink that evening. He is the only white boy among the black gangsters. Ricky has his eyes on the girl of a big shot, Johnny Curry, who happens to be the niece of the mayor of Detroit. Her bodyguards moonlight as local cops. Everyone is tied up here. In the morning, FBI agents burst into the Worshi house. They accused Richard of illegal manufacture, possession, and sale of weapons. The silencers were the issue. They wanted the man to turn in his buyers. Richard refused to make a deal. Then Agent Snyder called Ricky over and showed him photos of the gangsters. But he only pointed out the criminals who were already dead. He certainly didn't turn in Johnny Curry. Ricky and the gang members entertained themselves by shooting rats with a gun. One of them got splattered with blood. The feds realized they could pressure Ricky. One evening, they invited him to sit in a car. Inside was Detective Jackson from the narcotics unit. The streets were flooded with crack dealers. The boy saw firsthand what its consumption did to his sister. But these talks didn't affect Ricky. Then they showed him a photo of a dead guy with two shots to the head from a gun that his father had bought at the gun show. So the fate of Richard Sr. was in the boy's hands. Ricky agreed to cooperate. They took him to the point of sale to make a purchase. After completing the task, Ricky went home with a big duck he found in the trash. For his work, he received $300. Johnny Curry was marrying the mayor's niece. So he bought suits for the brothers and for Ricky as well since he was the best friend of one of them. The celebration was held at the mayor's residence. Ricky seemed to be the only white guy among all the guests, but later he noticed a man talking with Johnny. It was Orderick, the biggest supplier of goods, Ricky wandered around the mansion and dreamed of getting rich someday. After the banquet, the young people went cruising around the city. Ricky saw Brenda and invited her on a date. The girl thought the guy had already been killed. Usually when someone stops going to school, it means they've either been killed or jailed. Ricky hit on Brenda, and since he was very charming that day, Brenda couldn't resist and gave in right in the parking lot. Jackson assigned Ricky a new task, to sell drugs on the street. The boy didn't like this idea at all, however, he could keep all the profits, which amounted to $4,000. The teenager couldn't refuse such an offer. Soon he became one of the pushers, and the shoebox with money filled up to the top. The year 1985 arrived. Richard Sr. continued to resell weapons. One day he saw his son in a car with the cops. The man immediately searched his son's room and found a box with $10,000 in it. Richard lashed out at his son, he shouldn't have made a deal. He didn't care that the boy wanted to protect him. At night, Ricky grabbed the duck and drove to the cafe in his grandfather's car. It was a gift for his sister. Dawn looked worse than before. Her brother asked her to come home and leave Tyrone. He was killing her. Ricky forgot the keys in the car and it was stolen. The relatives ran outside and shot at it with double-barreled shotguns, but the thief managed to escape. However, they were immediately arrested possession of a firearm, driving without a license, and attempted murder. These were the charges against the young man, but the FBI agents promised to get him off in court. 
Grandpa was angry at Ricky because he was left without a car. The boy went to Johnny's garage. The gangsters asked him what he had told the cops since it was unclear why he was released so quickly. Also, Johnny didn't like that Ricky was selling on his turf. If he had even a gram with him, he shouldn't approach Johnny or any of his associates. Leon Lucas owed Johnny a lot of money. But for now, he managed to convince them to give him a delay. The criminal bought time by inviting the gangsters to a boxing match in Las Vegas. This way, Ricky learned what a truly luxurious life was. He found it hard to resist staring at Keith, Johnny's wife. He liked her at first sight. When it was time for the match, Johnny learned that no VIP seats had been reserved for them and all the tickets were sold out. So the gangsters had to watch the boxing on TV in a bar. After that, Johnny went to a party hosted by Art Arterick. There, during the day, a gangster who saw them not being allowed into the fight started mocking them. Johnny didn't tolerate this. He grabbed a champagne bottle and beat the gangster nearly to death with it. Johnny held a grudge against Leon Lucas, who dared to humiliate him like that and sent two fighters after him. They shot up the house when Leon's two little sons were inside. One of the boys didn't survive. The shooting was done with modified AK-47S. Ricky returned home to his father. Richard jokes with his son. The boy wears a huge gold star of David around his neck, even though he isn't Jewish. His father asks Ricky to return to school. He warns that Ricky will soon be so deeply involved in all this that he won't be able to get out. A bribed cop informs Johnny that the feds have an informant, so he needs to check his people. The big shot realizes that the murder of a child can't be covered up, and someone will go to jail he decides it should be some other black guy not from their gang. Everyone in the neighborhood is on edge. Ricky now avoids communication with the feds. He is currently staying with his grandparents. Richard decided to get rid of all the AK-47S he had just in case. Ricky confessed to his father that he plans to return to school. He went into the house to look at his father's fish. Johnny Curry's henchman dropped by. He apologized, pulled out a gun, and shot Ricky in the stomach. The young man was admitted to the hospital under a false name. Doctors are fighting for his life. Richard blames the feds for everything and intends to take revenge on the big shot. He waited for Johnny at his garage, but too many people arrived with the gangster. Richard couldn't bring himself to use the weapon. Agent Schneider visited Ricky to find out who shot him. The boy didn't confess, but they already knew who was behind the attempt. Besides, they had busted one of the spots and the dealers had given up Johnny. The special forces stormed Johnny's house and he was arrested along with the other gang members. Ricky was discharged from the hospital. He hoped to see his sister at home since Tyrone had already dumped her. But she was still wandering somewhere. Ricky wondered how he could attend school with a catheter. But after the shooting, they wouldn't let him in. He was a threat to the other kids. By 1986, Ricky still hadn't fully recovered. A 10-year-old kid confronted him, claiming he had impregnated his sister. Ricky had to man up and admit it. Ricky went to Brenda's to see his daughter, who was a month and a half old. He took the baby in his arms, and at that moment, Richard walked in. Grandpa was much more excited about the baby than his son was. He hadn't planned on having either Don or Ricky, but everything turned out great. Unlike his father, Ricky is not such an optimist. He hints to his father that he should start dealing drugs instead of weapons. That way, they would quickly get rich and improve their lives. But Richard has principles. He refuses to poison people on the street. The man got distracted from the road and they almost crashed into another car. Ricky keeps trying to convince his father, saying that Don isn't coming back because they live in poverty. Now he's a father too, and he needs money as well. Soon, Ricky visited Derek and arranged for supplies. After Johnny, he inherited a wide client base. One night, he and his father went to a den to bring Dawn home. Richard took his daughter in his arms and she started hysterically resisting. But weakened, she gave in. Now, she needed to go through withdrawal. Richard locked her in a room. Ricky really started making a lot of money and he began showering Brenda with food and clothes. The 16-year-old boy became the new big shot and Kathy was left without a husband. They glanced at each other. Richard did everything he could to get his daughter out of poverty. And finally, Don started to get better. 1987, Don became a recluse. Richard gathered his loved ones to celebrate the opening of the first video salon. 
One day, Ricky gathered courage and approached Kathy at a bar. Later that night, he went to her apartment and learned that Johnny had been sentenced to 20 years. This meant he could not only take over Johnny's business, but also claim his woman. Richard finally feels happy. Both children live under his roof, something they should cherish. He asks his son not to be greedy and not to take more than they need, or they could easily destroy it all, but it was too late. In the morning, a police squad stormed the house and both father and son were arrested. Jackson called the boy a complete idiot if he really thought he wouldn't get caught. Newspapers dubbed Ricky the cocaine baron. They found 8 kilograms of substance in his room. Richard protests as it was the feds who forced his son to sell on the streets. But who would believe a 15-year-old brat was working for the Federal Bureau? Relatives met with FBI agents at the motel. They refused to admit they coerced the boy into street sales. He did it on his own and got caught. Now he faces a life sentence, but Ricky could be freed if he helps infiltrate the organization. The feds want to get to the mayor through his niece, Kathy, with whom Ricky has become close. Richard convinced his son to agree. He asks for this agreement to be formalized on paper, but the agents refuse. They ask him to trust them verbally. Ricky went to Kathy and asked the mayor's people to help escort a large shipment. After the operation, 11 police officers and close friends of the mayor were arrested. TV directly stated the operation was thanks to Ricky Vershi. Richard reassures his relatives saying they made a deal with the feds and they'll keep quiet. Ricky's trial came to an end. The jury delivered its verdict. Richard Vershi Jr. was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of bail. Grandpa is outraged. The boy is only 17 years old. They took his life away. Ricky was taken to his new home, an hour of solitary exercise a day, the rest of the time he'll be in his cell. Richard waited for Agent Snyder outside the administration building, but she ignored him. She said no promises were made. The bureau asked for leniency, but the court didn't comply. And that was it. Richard found another agent. He explained they failed to arrest the mayor, so they had to catch a smaller fish, which turned out to be his son. Dawn came to Ricky with her daughter. Grandpa's health worsened after this. Maybe he won't recover. With tears in his eyes, Ricky asks his sister to show him pictures of his daughter more often. Richard took the phone and tried to calm his son down. He said he had been talking to agents and maybe Ricky would get out in about six years. But Ricky is in despair. This is not life but death. Richard was sure his son's life would be better than his own. But he's the one who ruined it for him. He asks Ricky for forgiveness. He assures Ricky that the family will always support him. But the boy simply hung up.